Uh, open, or open your Bibles if you have them. And we're only covering one verse of Scripture today, believe it or not, um, 1 Peter 3, 7. I'll go ahead and read it, and we'll, and we'll jump off from there. Uh, Peter writes to the early church. He's in a whole series on the idea of um, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. He's saying, hey, and the word subject also means submission. He's saying, as a Christian, we live out of subjection or submission to certain authorities. And believe me, when you, when you start talking about authority, you know, you talk, start talking about being inverted or going counter to culture, um, people do not like to come under authority. We like to be the authority of our lives. Like, I'm the master of me. You know, I'm the captain of my ship and the master of my fate, and no one's going to tell me what to do. And so when you, when, as a believer in Christ, and the Bible starts to say, be subject or be in submission and, and put yourself under the authority of others, um, that is not something that the world stands up and applaud and says, I want to get on, on board with that. But it's so much of a part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So we're in this section where, where Peter says, you know, um, be subject uh, for the Lord's sake because of Jesus to every human institution. And we've talked about that he said to government. And we talked about, hey, I'm under the authority of the police. Um, I'm under the authority of the mayor or the president. You know, there are certain authorities in our lives that we, we, we respect and we honor those positions. We said, um, that he said that, there, that we come under the authority in our occupation. Uh, maybe your occupation is a student, so you come under the authority of your teacher. If you're um, you know, under somebody at work, you're not the, the owner of the business. You're under their authority. And last week, we talked about where, where Peter said, wives, be subject to your husbands, or wives, be submissive to your husbands. And we talked about what that meant. We talked about how that was taken out of context, and we'll talk a little bit more about that today and how it's been misused and abused. But today, we come to the husband's part. Uh, and so we're coming, how do we live out these lives of subjection or submission um, in this world, in the government, in our occupation, and in, in our home. So here's our verse today, 1 Peter 3, 7. It says, likewise, meaning, like, hey, husbands, you know, we've talked about submission in government, submission in work, submission for wives to husbands. In the same way, likewise, you husbands, you have some submissing, submissing and subjecting to do as well. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not uh, be hindered. So husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. And we're going to break that down. But in the, in the greater context of things, I want to, this, the next verse in your outline, um, just to put this in its place, at, at the beginning of this section, again, Peter writes says, he says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passage of the flesh, which war against your soul. To start with, he says, your sojourners and your exiles, it's like your pilgrims. He's saying, this is not your home. Like, we live on earth, but we are made for more than this. And when we come into the family of God, we've been given eternal life. We've been given a salvation. And our, our, our real lives are going to be with God in heaven. And so right now, we're just sojourners. We're exiles. We're pilgrims living in a foreign land and living among foreigners. So when you're at your home, even, sometimes in some cases, when you're at your school, when you're in your neighborhood, when you're at work, you're living as like a refugee. You're like an exile. You're a foreigner uh, in a foreign land. And, and, and so that, 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 that changes the way that we live. And what he said, at the very end of that verse, he says, um, and he says, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which war against your soul. That every day we're in a battle. We're in a, in a war. And, and, we, and we don't want to lose that war. We want to understand what is it that we need to know and how do we live our lives um, in this world so that brings honor and glory to, to God. Uh, I, the next verse on your outline, th this is maybe why some of you are here. It, is we're, gonna, we're going back and setting this up because all of this is building up to where we are. This, this, is, this is it. This is, this is so important. 2 Peter 2, 8, 9. He says, but you, that is those of us who have chosen to follow Christ and are part of the church, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, and then he gives every one of us who are followers of Jesus our purpose for life. This is it. He says that you, you, me, all of us, may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That is your goal. That is my goal. That is our goal for living. It's that each and every day when I get up and I start living my life in my home, when I leave my home and I'm in my neighborhood and I get to work or I go out to the community, the goal of my life ought to be to proclaim that everything I do, everything that I think, everything that I say is going to proclaim the excellencies of him who called me out of darkness and into his marvelous light. It's as simple as that. I want to honor God. I want to, I want to make sure that everything I do is going to be proclaiming and pointing people to God and saying, you know what, he is. And he's called me out of darkness and, and he, I'm in the light now and I want to shine some of that light 
into other people's lives. That is the mission that God gives to you and me. Maybe you've heard it said that you got to keep, the main thing is to keep the main thing what? The main thing. And this is the main thing. That every day, the main thing for my life is, God, am I proclaiming the excellencies of you who called me out of darkness and into light? And, and that's going to be played out in the way that I'm subject to the, to the authorities in my life, the government, teachers, um, employers, uh, um, in the home, wherever I go, how I'm living my life, how I'm conducting my life, it's going to proclaim and point people to Christ. That's the goal, because not everybody is yet a follower of Jesus, And God has sent us and he's positioned us to be in that place to shine light so that they can see Christ in us. So that's all the context and that's the backdrop for why he's leading us down this road of subjection. And we finally get to this verse where he says, likewise, husbands, you know, as you're living with your wife in your home, live in such a way as that you proclaim the excellencies of God that called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And how do you do that? And we're going to break this down in several ways. Let me just read the verse again. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. What does it look like for a husband to live in subjection, to live in submission in the home and proclaim the excellencies of God um, through, through his relationship with his wife. I want you to notice first, it says, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. If you want to make a note on your outline or underline it, that word, those words in an understanding way, it literally could be translated according to knowledge. Is that I want you, there's some things I need you to be knowledgeable about, about the, about the relationship you have with your wife so that you can live with her in a way that brings honor and glory to me, that you need knowledge. Because the bottom line is, is that before we came to Christ, we were living in darkness. Now we have light. Before we came to Christ, we were living in ignorance. And now we are supposed to make, uh, become knowledgeable and receive the knowledge that God um, gives us. There's a verse there on your, on your outline, the next one, 1 Peter 1, 14. It says, as obedient children, do not conform to the passions of your former ignorance is that before we came to Christ, we lived in ignorance. We lived in darkness. We lived in blindness. And all of a sudden, the the beauty and the light of Christ and the gospel has come into our lives, and he wants to bring new information and a new way of living because we're foreigners, we're aliens, and the way that that the world does things, we're different. And that goes counter to culture, and the world is upside down, but God wants to set us up right um, in the kingdom of God. So we're coming, and he's saying, I want you not to be ignorant anymore. I want you to understand some things. You need this, there's some knowledge that you um, need to have. And so again, this is what we're gonna try to understand this morning is what is this knowledge that, that men in, in, a, in a marriage relationship need to have in order to live with their wife um, in an understanding or knowledgeable way? And there's a couple, there's several different areas and you can mark these if you'd like. We're gonna talk about what it means for him to honor his wife. We're gonna talk about a little bit about what it means for him. It's not just any wife or any woman, but it's his wife. You know, husbands, we should be, and if you're going to be a future husband, and if you're going to be a future wife, you, you want to have a husband that's like this, is that we become students of our wives, and we, that we go to the school of our wife and go, how do I know her the very best? I want to be knowledgeable about who she is and what makes her tick, and, and so that I can love and serve and, and just honor her in the best way. So see, we're going to show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. What does it mean when Peter says that, that the woman is the weaker vessel? And what does it mean when he says, since they are the heirs of the grace of life? What are they the heir of? What, it mean, what does it mean, the grace of life? And then how does that affect our prayer? So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So what does it mean, husbands, um, showing honor to the woman? What does it mean to show honor? This is not something that's unique to this relationship. If we go back um, in, in our study, we started this, this, uh, this whole section on subjection. It said, be subject to the government. Uh, 1 Peter 2.17, it says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the emperor. Is that as believers, we're called to honor other people. We talked about give everyone the honor that is due them. There are certain types of honor that I'm going to give to to one person, a certain type of honor that's due to another. And it's not always the same, but the bottom line is, as a Christian, I should be living in an honorable way. And what does that mean in this context of subjection? It means that I honor, I esteem, I I, I add value and I I put up on kind of like on a pedestal and say, you know what, this person, and in this particular case, it's the bride of this person, I'm going to put that woman up on a pedestal, my bride, and say, you know what, her needs are more important than my own. I'm going to honor her. I'm going to value what's going on in her life as much as, if not more, than what's going on in my own life. I want to show her honor. That's what it means to live in a a Christian marriage. I think... um, 
in many ways, this, this is pretty significant, especially compared to what we talked about last week when it said, wives, submit to your husbands, or wives, be subject to your husbands. Because we talked about how that was taken out of context. Remember, I said, like, um, if you just take that verse and you pull it out, and this is the way it's been used in so many situations, is that you find some man somewhere, and he goes, you know what? Well, you think you're a Christian woman. Well, what does the Bible say? Submit to me. And it's like he's putting his foot on her neck and saying, no, the Bible says if you're going to be a good Christian, you've got to submit. But he's not looking at it in, in the context of all that's going on here. He's taking that verse out of context in the same way I can say that the Bible says, there's a Bible verse that says, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. And I can just pull that verse out of context and say, hey, guys, the Bible says, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. Let's go. Y'all ready? Amen. We're sent. No, we're not going to do that because that's not what the Bible teaches. You've got to look at it in its greater context. And, and there's no way in the world that the Bible is giving permission to any man to say to his wife, the Bible says, you submit to me, you do what I say. That is so ungodly, that is so unchristlike, and, and I, I don't know if I could say it more strongly. If I'm showing honor to my wife, that is not showing my wife honor. That, that is not showing honor at all, and that is not a Christian way to live. And so when it says, honor your wives and, uh, to the woman um, who is a weaker vessel, in no way does it mean that. So what does it mean to honor our wives? How do, how do we honor them? And it gives us a couple, and this is where the next part of the verse comes in. Uh, it gives us a couple different ways. It says, as the weaker vessel, and also as they are heirs with us as the grace of life. So what does it mean first that they are the weaker vessel? Literally, that word vessel could be translated body. And it, notice it says, it's not just, it says it's the weaker vessel, which means what else? It means also that we as men are also vessels. It's literally just talking about our bodies. It's talking about our genetics, our DNA, that, each, that every man that has a Y chromosome, he is genetically, um, uh, what would be the word? I'm, I'm, I'm totally drawn to blank. I shouldn't use my notes. He's stronger because of his genetics. It's nothing that I did. And that's not universally true. Paul, Peter is talking in generalities, but generally speaking, men are physically stronger than women, bottom line. Are there women that are stronger than me and, and can compete and do things better than me? Absolutely, and I'm gonna share a, a humbling example here in a minute. Uh, but, but the bottom line is, is that there are differences between men and women, and, and we should respect that and understand that and, and live with that in, in an understanding way. You think about the sports world. How many Olympic sports are there where men and women compete equally um, together against each other for the gold medal? In curling, men and women pe compete together as teams, but it's not woman against man, man against woman. But that's the only one that I can think of. Every other sport, it's man against man, man against man, woman against woman, woman against woman. Think about basketball. Do men and women compete against each other as equals? Why are we so sexist? Why don't we let, we, they might be. It might be. <laughs> and, and that's just it, is that, Men, like in, in, it's in golf, it's in tennis, it's in um, baseball and softball, it's in basketball, it's in, it's in every sport. Men have an advantage because of our DNA, because of our genetics. We are physically stronger as a rule. And so women are physically weaker. Now, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell an example. And um, I, when I was in college, I was probably 19 at the time, I was working in a gym at, on campus, and I had a manager, and she was a lady. And uh, she was a college basketball player. And she was probably at least my equal in height, if not taller. Um, and, uh, and she had some gifts. And we played one-on-one -on -one basketball one time. Guess who won? Not me. Yeah. <laughs> I lost. I had the worst shooting day of my life. You know, I can make every kind of excuse. But she was, uh, she was superior to me in that instance. Uh, and so, this, you know, so while men are, generally speaking, physically stronger than women, it doesn't mean that women can't um, excel and, and beat a man at some physical thing. There are a lot of women that, that are a lot better than me at a lot of sports and, and different things like that. But the general principle here is, is that the woman is the weaker vessel. So why does he bring that up? Why does he talk about that? So, so let me go back. He says, honor, uh, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Because here's the deal, I think, is that men are physically stronger. And as a result of that, we can, if we wanted to, physically dominate the other gender. We could choose to do that. But the way of Christ is not to use the physical advantage that we've been given to put anybody under our thumb. But a Christian marriage looks like, you know what? I may be physically stronger, 
but my wife is equal to me, or, and, and women are equal to me in, in so many different ways, and I'm going to show them honor, and I'm not going to just use my dominance to say, you know what, I'm going to use my physical dominance and keep you from doing other things and put you under me, but I'm going to give you, out of humility and subjection, I'm going to give you opportunity to lead and to serve and to do things because you are capable. It's not just, I think we could so misuse the genetic advantage that God has given us to dominate when we should use it and say, you know what, um, I want to live and honor and do it for the Lord's sake because that's what Christ did for me. He subjected himself to the Father's will and said, you know what, God, I'm gonna subject myself. I'm gonna humble myself. I'm gonna show honor um, to my wife and I'm not gonna physically dominate her and say, you submit to me because I could physically make you do that. That's no kind of marriage and it's certainly not a godly marriage. And so God wants so much more for us. Uh, So what does it mean then that we are also fellow heirs of the grace of life? Uh, He says, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you um, of the grace of life. Um, What does it mean to be an heir? You know, it's somebody that has an inheritance. Earlier in this book, Peter talked about the inheritance that all of us as followers of Jesus get. Um, 1 Peter 1, 4 It says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Each of us have a common um, salvation and a common inheritance. God is going to accept us and welcome us uh, equally uh, as sons and daughters of his into the kingdom of God. But it means so much more than this. When he says, you're heirs together of the grace of life. And I want to focus on that little section there for a second, the grace of life. What is this grace? Grace is literally, um, it's a, it comes from the Greek word charis, which means unmerited favor. It's undeserved favor. And an interesting fact about the word grace, did you know that Jesus never once used the word grace? You ever thought about that? It's such a huge Bible principle. And I think Jesus, would, Jesus used the word gospel. Um, and, and, and those are essentially the same things, but he's talking about, about he's talking about the, we're heirs together of the grace of life, and, and it's that unmerited favor. And this, this idea of, of unmerited favor is really foreign to us, particularly in our culture, but I think worldwide, because we don't typically show favor to people who don't deserve it. Everything we do is kind of on a debt, debtor relationship, or you earn this, and so I'm going to show you favor. When my kids do their, you know, I just don't hand out money to my kids, you know, it's like, here, you're just awesome. Well, means that there's favor because they're awesome. But no, you did your chores. Here's what you've earned. I'm going to show you some favor. Here's some, here's some money for you. Man, you were especially kind to your brother. You were especially kind to your sister. I'm going to show you favor. Uh, we, we, you know, we don't, we don't um, show unmerited favor generally at work. You know, the bosses are just not there handing out bonuses. You know, hey, you guys did a terrible job this week. You don't deserve anything. Here's a $1,000 bonus. No, when you work hard, when you excel, when you go the extra mile, then maybe you merit a bonus. So we don't really deal in unmerited, and that's not to say that there's not ever times that unmerited favor isn't shown, but as a rule, we don't do that. Even the, even the people that we have friendships with, we choose to be friends with so many people, um, you know, it, it's not because they just, you know, they're un, we're showing them our unmerited favor, is that we find some merit in them. We say we like, you know, the, the same things, and, and they do things that we like, so we're going to give them our friendship. And so we don't, we don't get this concept, but I want us to get this in, in this context. It says we are, we are heirs together of the grace, the unmerited favor of God, the grace of life. What does that mean? It means, and you've heard this expression, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And for every husband, for every wife, for every individual married or not, we all come to God as a destitute, undeserving men and women who do not deserve God's grace, that God does not have to show us his favor, and that none of us in any way is is more deserving of God's salvation, of his forgiveness, and of his grace. It's unmerited, and that every man and every woman in any relationship, they come together. None of us are more deserving. We all come to the cross uh, as equals, as destitute, and in need of his grace. Look at Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates uh, his love, own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't look down from heaven and say, oh, there's some really good people that I want Christ to die for. There's a handful of them that they're better than the rest, and so Christ is going to die for them. No, it says, while we were yet all yet sinners, God demonstrates his own love for this while we were still sinners. 
while we still, we did not deserve any favor, we did not deserve any love, we did not deserve any forgiveness, Christ died for us. That's where, that's the common foundation for every one of us. And that's the gospel, is that none of us deserve God's favor, but by his grace, Christ came and died for us. The gospel message, it says, Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Jew, Gentile, husband, wife, parent, child, all of us alike. We were destitute sinners, but we have been recipients of the grace of life. Husbands do not deserve any of God's favor any more than the wife. And so when it says to husbands, show, you know, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to them as the weaker vessel and heirs together of the grace of life, that we all come, we, we've all been given God's grace. We didn't deserve it, but he poured it out on us. And that should humble us. I don't deserve God's grace. My neighbor my coworker, your, the people in your lives, those that, that really just rub you the wrong way, you know, none of them. But you don't deserve it any more than they do. God saved us, and we owe everything to him that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's what God calls us to. So what does it mean then that our prayers would, may not be hindered? As so we get to the end of this passage on, for us as husbands, and I think there, there's something so interesting going on here, and I'm convinced that, that this little part of this verse has had a huge impact, A, on some individual men, B, on some, some marriages, and C, on our churches. That some of the weakness that's going on in those areas, individually as men, um, and in our marriage relationships, and in our churches, is that our prayers are being hindered. And why is that? It's because we are not following this verse and showing honor to our wives and living with them according to knowledge and in an understanding way as a weaker vessel and heirs together the grace of life. Because you know what happens? When I'm sinning, am I praying? No, you can't. I don't think you can sin and pray simultaneously. And if I'm committing, and if I've committed a sin, how likely am I going to be praying afterwards? Usually I'm going to be filled with some sort of guilt, and there's going to, sin creates distance in relationships. And it is a sin for us as men, for us as husbands, to not um, live with our wives in an understanding way and to show honor to them. And when we're not doing that, we're sinning. And so that means we're, we can't be praying, and that means probably we're not praying with our wives. And even if we were, those prayers are being hindered because there's brokenness in that relationship. And so I think there, there's a powerful tool here that if, if some of us would take a step of faith this morning, about our prayer lives. And I, I want to I break off here for just a second. I, don't, I, I think this may, there, um, this may be the most powerful thing that I've got in my message today. Prayer is intimacy. Prayer is intimacy with God. Prayer is one of the most intimate things that you and I can do. It's exposing our hearts, exposing our souls. And, and so because of that, um, a lot of times it's one of the things that people are weakest at because none of us likes to be vulnerable. And intimacy is difficult. I want to share an illustration. Just last week, we had um, a time of prayer at 5 o'clock, and we're going to do that again this afternoon. If, if you're here, this is optional. I don't want to put any, you know, again, pressure. This is, if, you're, if you're able and you um, want to be here and can be here, come out and pray. But I want to share an example of what happened last week. We had a prayer time, and every time we have a prayer time, I, I am really um, conscientious to do this and tell people, look, we're going to pray, and we're going to pray out loud, but I'm gonna, I, I know that prayer is so intimate. I tell people, look, you don't have to pray out loud. Because I know that some people just aren't in that place spiritually. They're not ready to pray in front of people. They have a hard time you know, just pouring out their own soul to God because it's a very intimate thing. And, and it, so for them to pray out loud and expose their soul, it, I mean, that, that's frightening for people. And so I tell people, look, we're going to pray. We're going to share some prayer requests. And we're going to hand out some prayer requests. But look, if you don't feel comfortable praying out loud, you just pray in your heart. It'll be fine. No judgment. You just pray in your heart. So we broke up into groups and we shared prayer requests and different people took the different areas of prayer that we we're going to pray over. And I said, you know, you, look, you don't, if any of you all don't feel comfortable praying out loud, again, I don't want you to feel guilty. Don't, you don't have to pray out loud. It's okay. Just pray in your heart. And one of the people in our group said, you know what, I don't, I don't, I'm not real comfortable praying out loud. I'm like, that's okay. That's fine. You just pray in your heart. So we all bow our heads and we start praying. And lo and behold, came around, we prayed, people, different people are praying. And all of a sudden that person that said they weren't really comfortable praying in front of people started praying. They started pouring out their heart to God. 
And it was incredibly vulnerable of them. And tears started coming in their eyes, and they started crying as they were just praying to God about some things in their own life, about some things in their community, because it's this incredibly intimate thing. And for someone to break that barrier and say, you know what, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray out loud. I'm going to expose myself in this way and reveal my heart to come into the presence of God with you and be in that way, that's an incredibly intimate thing. And it's just a powerful, and, and I want to encourage you, you know, to take that risk, um, you know, to come to a prayer time and just know, hey, I'm not going to, no, no one's ever, you know, as far as is, whenever I'm leading, no one's ever going to call on you and say, hey, so-and-so, would you pray for us? And you'd be like, ah, oh, good gracious, I don't know how to pray out loud. You know, I'm not going to do that to you. But man, it's a powerful and intimate thing. But now transition that back to our relationship in our families between husbands and wives. Again, prayer is such an intimate thing. It is one of the most intimate things that a husband and a wife can share together. Are our prayers being hindered? And if so, why? Are we praying with our wives? And if we aren't, why not? And how does that affect us individually? How does it affect the the power of our marriage? And how does that affect us as a church if that's not happening in our lives and in our homes? It's a big deal. So husbands, 1 Peter 3, verse 7, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to them as the weaker vessel, the heirs together of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. It's a really really serious and powerful verse. God wants to move in our church. He wants to move in your marriage, and he wants to move in your individual life, husband. And it has something to do with this prayer thing. So I want to give you a challenge, and I know it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to be a huge challenge for some, and I'll give you kind of a couple different levels of it. But husbands, men, I want to challenge you, if you're married, to honor your wife and to live with her in an understanding way, And to humble yourself and remember that the ground is level at the foot of the cross and that you and your wife are heirs together in the grace of life and that you, over the next seven days, say a prayer together. For some of you, and again, I'm not, I'm going to give you an out here in a second because some of you are like, I don't know, I can't, I've never prayed with my wife. I don't know how to do that. And that would be too big of a step. And I I would just, A, ask you, well, let's, let's just draw that into question it's not a judgment, but say, let's not, let's not stay there. Let's grow from there. What is it about prayer that I need to learn? Can I learn something about prayer? And maybe seek out some help and go, how can I pray together? And maybe your wife is, is, is better at praying, and you can seek her and humble yourself. That would be a cool thing. And say, God, I'm going to invite you into this. God, for your glory, because we want to make and we want to proclaim the excellencies of you who called us out of darkness and in the light. God, you're so awesome. Let's pray together.